Well, hello everybody again. Welcome to another great show of the Van Buren Variety Show. I am Bob Van Buren, your host. As always, glad to see my audience here, my regulars, and also I see some newcomers out there uh, that have logged into the live show. So we welcome you as well. And even those that are not watching this live, whether you're watching this days or weeks or months, maybe years later, appreciate the, uh, the support. Uh, and uh, hope you enjoy the shows that we have here. For those of you that are new, it is a variety show, and it's just basically what it is. Every week at Tuesday evening at 7 p.m. Central and 8 p.m. Eastern, I have an individual guest to talk about an interesting topic. It could be about their profession. It might be a general interest. It might be a hobby. They might play some music. Hence the word variety. So anything and everything can occur on the show. But if you want to know topics coming up and you want to stay tuned, you might want to hit that subscribe button if you haven't already. would love that support. And also, just don't watch this show and then leave. If you like tonight's guest and you like tonight's topic, make sure you hit that like button. I'm sure a guest tonight would really appreciate that too. So uh, again, welcome to the Van Buren Variety Show, and I appreciate all the support you've all given me uh, these past two years. So thank you very much. Hope you've all had a great week so far. I have had an interesting week. I actually had to get a brand new iPhone. And it wasn't by choice, actually. Because, I don't know if you can see this on camera, look what I did. I completely dropped my camera and it shattered front and back. Yeah. Uh, take it from me, iPhones and cement, hitting cement, they don't mix. So. Yeah, it was beyond repair. It was time. The screen is all messed up, too. I mean, it's got all these little uh, dots, or we call it pixels, in there. And so you can't hardly read the text anymore. So, yeah, I had to go get an iPhone. I guess it was time to get a new one anyway. But, uh, oh, well. I liked it, but it didn't like the price. So, uh, just uh, might be common sense. If you're working somewhere with a cement floor, make sure your phone's either on you or not so close to the desk. Don't do what I did. So... Yeah, it didn't sound good and didn't look good either. So, <laughs> uh, I killed an iPhone over the weekend. There it is. So. <laughs> anyway, that's all uh, for that. Uh, got a uh, interesting topic tonight, and it's one that I really, really appreciate and enjoy. Especially, if think about this. Okay, if it's late at night and you're in bed and you're trying to go to sleep, okay? What would be the best kind of story to read at that point? No, not a boring science uh, novel. You would want to read a scary show and make a scary book. Make sure the lights are turned down just enough where you can read and be by yourself in bed reading it. And for the even better effect, make sure it's raining outside. <laughs> Am I intriguing you so far? So uh, if that's the case, uh, we've got someone that writes those scary stories that you would probably be very, very interested in if you're like me uh, and likes good suspense. So without further ado, let me bring my guest on tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to introduce you to Francesca Maria. She's going to talk about her books and all of her works, and so uh, we're looking forward to it. So Francesca, welcome to the Van Buren Variety Show. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me. And hi, everyone. Uh, now you write scary stories. Mm -hmm. So uh, tell us kind of about your, your genre in, in general. Sure, yeah. I dabble mostly in horror, but I kind of branch out into dark fiction, dark fantasy. Um, I'm a big fan of Neil Gaiman. And so, mm -hmm. you know, all things Neil Gaiman, that's kind of the flavor that and the world that I try to, to go in. But more in the dark horror side than in the fantasy side. I don't do too much in science fiction, um, but I have explored, you know, body horror, um, keiju, which is big monster stuff, um, mm -hmm. a variety of different subgenres within horror. Um, so I kind of like to stretch my muscles and see what I can do, what kind of interesting things I can come up with within the horror genre. I'm thinking, too, uh, a lot of the horror genre uh, authors that are out there. How would you compare your work if you had to compare it like, would it be more Alfred Hitchcock? Would it be more Stephen King? Where, where would you gel yours? Or Wes Craven, even. <laughs> oh, good. Yeah, nice. So so I kind of sit in between Clive Barker and his Books of Blood and mm -hmm. Neil Gaiman's kind of his short story collection, Smokes and Mirrors. 
um, with maybe a little bit of grim fairy tales mixed in there as well. Oh. So, but that's a pretty big, wide um, gap there. So you can think of me as a little bit in between. Okay. Well, let's talk about your latest uh, book that has just come out, actually, didn't it? Yeah. Yeah. About a week and a half ago. Yeah. So I will display this and uh, I'll uh, let my audience, uh, uh, you can tell my audience about it. But now for those of you that don't have the video, they're only listening on audio. I'll read the book title to you when we display it. Uh, she has a book called They Hide. Short stories to tell in the dark. Oh, okay, okay. You're intrigued, this Francesca. So go ahead from here. <laughs> <laughs> so they hide short stories to tell in the dark. Collects thirteen tales of horror. Thirteen. It, thirteen. <laughs> lucky thirteen. Um, it's my love letter to horror tropes. Oh. So there's you know a witch story in there, a werewolf story, a vampire story, ghost story couple of demon stories in there. Wow. Um, I've always loved anthologies that focus specifically on a theme. So whether it's a whole book on witches or a whole book on zombies. And I love seeing different writers take their own slant on these kind of well-worn tropes. Mm -hmm. And I always thought it would be a really neat challenge if I could write a whole collection on these well-worn tropes and see if I had something new to say how do I think about these tropes? You know, what a, what can I come up with that might be something new and different that other people haven't seen or done yet? And so that's where the collection came from. That's great. And you know what? I think you've already intrigued probably a good majority of my audience because a good majority of my audience are also a subscriber to the Cryptid channels. Oh, Bigfoot. yes. Yes. So I think there's probably something for everybody in this story, this anthology here. <laughs> yeah, I've got, let's see, I'm trying to think of the cryptos. I've got a um, Mothman short story in there. Mothman. Mm -hmm. oh. I've got a Wendigo story. Um, werewolf. I don't, would you consider werewolves cryptids? Probably not. Well, let me ask my not. audience. I'm not sure how to answer that. So audience, yeah. those of you that are watching this, here's the question. Honestly, do you consider werewolf or werewolves a cryptid? We'll see what the audience says. Okay, right. go ahead, Francesca. All right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it's it's a labor of love. Um, I wrote it during COVID. Um, as most of us did when the early days of COVID hit, I was in a pretty heightened state of panic um, and anxiety. And I've always used writing as an outlet for that. Um, mm -hmm. I grew up in a haunted house. And so oh, you did. I did. Yeah, it was a really terrifying experience from my childhood. And so I started writing horror at the age of six as a way of releasing some of those fears because I wasn't allowed to talk about it. Um, my siblings and I didn't talk about it because we thought it would get worse. And my parents um, thought we were crazy and didn't believe us. Uh, and wow. so I, the only outlet I had at the time was writing. So whenever I've had a difficult time over my years, whether it's you know anxiety driven, a lot of stress, I always turn to writing as a way of kind of exercising those feelings out. And when I get it on page, it kind of leaves my body, and I can I can kind of process things a little bit easier that way. Travel to your own world, you know. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Yeah. You said you started writing these stories when you were six years old. Yep. Yeah. Wow. Oh. My wow. my first story at the age of six was uh, a group of kids who come across a haunted house at the end of a cul-de-sac. Um, and it was very, you know, very much what I was experiencing, but I was able to give my characters the tools that they needed to go through the haunted house and survive and come out the other end. Whereas when I was experiencing in, in real life, I didn't have control. I felt very helpless. And so writing about the ending, writing about characters that, you know, can save the day was a way for me to kind of find my own courage and confidence in getting through the, the terrifying house that I grew up in. Let me ask you, did you have, I mean, if I can ask you a personal question on that, sure. living in that haunted house, and of course you were writing stories about it, did you have nightmares too as a child about that, or pattern, should I say pattern nightmares? Yeah, yeah, there's um, a lot of very repeating nightmares that took place, um, mm -hmm. a lot of demonic type stuff, Ooh. a lot of falling a lot of just really scary repetitive nightmares yeah yeah 
And did that I guess that provided some kind of fodder, or did you get did you get a lot of information from your nightmares to put into your story as well? I I still do. Yeah, you do? yeah. Oh wow. So so now I when I ever I get a nightmare, I I'm like, oh goody, I can harvest that and turn that into a story. Um, in fact, one of the short stories in They Hide is it's a short story called A Game of Ghosts, and it came from a nightmare. I just saw in the nightmare um, this woman screaming where's my baby, where's my baby? And sh this little tiny girl was going up a slide in a playground and didn't come down the end of the slide. So that was my dream that I had. And I didn't know what was taking place or what was going on. So then I grabbed my notebook and just started writing that story as fast as I could. That is awesome. You know, that reminds me of a story that I heard. Uh, I don't remember, you know, the exact source, but and this gives me chill about telling this story. <laughs> where uh, it was a mother and her young daughter, who's about maybe five or six years old. It was an upstairs, downstairs, you know, house, you know, two-story. And uh, it was late at night, and the little girl was downstairs. And uh, uh, she thought she heard her mother call me. Hey, you know, I'll say... Mm -hmm. Anne, that might not have been her name. Right. Anne, come up here, come up here. But this mother kept calling this little girl. Anne, you've got to come up to this, come up to the, you know, the second floor, the two story. She was just about to go up the stairs. Okay, at the foot of the stairs, a hand grabs her, pulls her in the other room. It's her mother, and she said, "I heard it too." Oh, <laughs> chills. <laughs> yeah, I know. Like, oh man, I would be freaking out if that happened to me. Yeah, um, wow. we in our haunted house. We had a lot of bangings, noises, phantom footsteps in an attic that was unfinished, um, rattling and scratching from inside closet doors, toys moving, TVs going on and off. Yeah, we had wow. we had the gamut of stuff. Oh, listen, I want you to know. Uh, I asked uh, that question to our audience. It's a resounding yes. Oh, excellent. Majority of people have said werewolves are definitely cryptids. I thought so. so. Okay, there you go. So, Great. Yeah, let me just uh, tantalize my cryptid audience again. Yeah, I think this might be a book for y'all because it's got what? Now, go down again. It's got witches, ghosts, uh, monsters. Werewolves, windigos, oh. mermaids, elves. Um, let's see, what else did I throw into the mix? A little bit Demon. of everything. <laughs> yeah, yeah, aliens for sure. Um, yeah, a little bit of everything. And I love your artwork. For those of you that are only hearing this on audio, the, the, the book cover is a, a, some stairs, like going upstairs, but underneath the stairs you see these orange eyes peeking out. Did you do the artwork too? <laughs> no, no, I can't take credit. So this is another horror trope, right, of something lurking oh. under the stairs. And so this is done by the very talented Keelan Patrick Burke um, through Bridget's Gate Press. Oh wow, they did a good they did a good job. Yeah, yeah, he uh, did great. Now you've got another workout too that I'd like to you know we'd like to talk about this too. So, yeah. ladies and gentlemen, this is called the Black Cat Chronicles, Greyfriars Cemetery. Mm -hmm. So obviously black cats are here, but uh, let us kind of know about the story. Now is this a one big story? Or this is also an anthology of short stories. So this is actually a comic book. So this is a, a single issue. Oh. Yep, it's oh. a single issue. In fact, I've got it here. I can show you Please. some of the art. Um, yes. It is a single issue comic. Oh, this is a good page. Um, I'm not the artist. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, the artist is a, a very talented man by the name of Nate Olson. And so for 19 years, my husband and I co-owned a comic book store mm -hmm. um, called Black Cat Comics. And oh, okay. We, and, <laughs> And after a while, we're like, man, we're, we're such big fans of comics. Let's let's put out, see if we can put out comics that we want to read. Mm -hmm. And so we produced our own series of comics. So Black Cat Chronicles are true horror tales narrated by a mystical and mythical black cat. Um, so Ooh. this particular story that you have, so we've got three issues so far. This is the first one. Okay. It takes place in Scotland, and it's about um, this haunted possessed cemetery called Greyfriar Cemetery. Well, where people go to this day and they're pushed and shoved and scratched. There's been not one, but two exorcisms there unsuccessfully. Wow. Um, there's 
tales of body snatchers, there's tales of torture and plague victims. So we run the gamut, it's all true, if you can believe it. It's true, true It's story. all true, yeah. Um, the second issue is uh, Alaska's Port Chatham, and it's actually about a town in the turn of the 19th century that goes missing from a cryptid. Um, I don't from a cryptid, there, it, there it is again, yep. Cryptid, that's a Bigfoot <laughs> story. Um, and then the third one that we just put out is called Invasion Antarctica, and it's about all of these really strange secret military missions that the U.S., the U.K., um, and the Nazis did around World War II in Antarctica. And there's some strange stuff that they supposedly found underneath the ice there. It almost sounds like The Thing. Remember the movie The Thing? Yes, yes, <laughs> yeah. Even, even stranger than that. Ooh, even stranger. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow, yeah. wow. So on uh, your, your book, so you said this is going to be the first, how many uh, issues of this are, is there going to be, like, uh, books? So, so there's three done total, three, and I'm working okay. on the fourth right now. And they're, they're comic books, so they're like, you know, between 24 and 32 pages mm -hmm. um, of art and story. The fourth one should be out hopefully later this year, and it's on um, Portland, Oregon's underground, where um, there's this uh, really nasty history of human trafficking, of young men getting drunk at bars, um, literally a trap door in the bar would take them un underground oh. where they would then be um, taken on boats and used as slave labor. Um, and so that's the story that I'm researching right now. Wow. So on the, uh, I'm going to go back to this one right here. Um, so you said a lot of this was based on some of your own personal experience uh, mm -hmm. living in you know, a haunted house. If you don't mind, could you tell us some of the stories? I mean, I know we're, we're very intrigued. If you sure. if you can tell them, there's like, I've got a ghost story that I it took me almost 20 years to finally be able to tell. So is there something yeah. you can tell us? Because I mean, I know we're intrigued. Yeah, sure, yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, there's two stories in the collection that are semi-autobiographical. Okay. The, the one of them's called My Brother Andy, and the first part is pretty much what it was like growing up in my house. And then the second one is Zombies Are Real, and I'll leave that one to the side. But okay. as far as a ghost story, so one of the things that happened a lot just to me in, my, in the house I grew up in was I was getting trapped in the bathroom. So let me paint a picture for you. Okay. 1970s, there's seven people living in the house. I've got four other siblings. I'm the youngest. Um, we each had our own particular haunting, our own particular flavor of terror that whatever was in our house targeted us. Wow. They, it would like to separate us. And so my particular horror was in the bathroom. So once I was old enough to shower on my own, let's say seven or eight, um, I would get locked in the bathroom. And our bathroom lock was a very simple push button turn lock. There wasn't a sure. key involved. It was, it was just turn it and it would open. Um, but it never did. It would get jammed. So much so that my dad would have to go get a screwdriver and literally take the whole doorknob apart. And it would take, you know, 15, 20 minutes. It felt like hours. And then, you know, remove the door. And that didn't happen once, twice, three times. It happened a, over a dozen times. And he would change the lock each time, couldn't figure it out. My dad was a very smart engineer type guy. It baffled him. And it never happened to anybody else in the house except for me. Now, while I was being trapped in the bathroom waiting to be rescued, I could feel this dark, creepy, pervy type energy literally sitting on my back. Um, and it felt so uncomfortable. It's not like somebody asked me before, does it feel like oppressive, humid heat like, you know, in, mm -hmm. in Texas? Yes. And it's no, it does not feel like that. <laughs> it, <laughs> it literally feels like there's somebody um, on top of you. And it was it was really terrifying. Scary. Yeah, wow. it was awful. And so then it, that's why I write about it. <laughs> did it only happen to you in the bathroom or did it happen to yeah. your siblings? I was the only one in the bathroom that got trapped. Um, my other, you know, siblings had other stuff happen to them. So like my oldest sister lived, her bedroom was near the attic, which was the scariest part of the house. Mm -hmm. The attic was this, un, you know, unfinished part of the house. There's no floorboards. We just like would store toys and Christmas decorations in there and stuff. 
and she'd constantly hear footsteps and the little door to the attic would constantly open mm. and it was yeah it was terrifying for her up there did you ever do research later? I mean, well, let me ask you this first before I ask yeah. this question. Did how long did your family live in the house? I mean, were you still a child when they y'all moved, or did you were you grown already when your family moved? Yeah, so I was there from zero to fourteen, and then my family moved into another town. Not because it was haunted, you know, they, they didn't like leave like the Amityville Horror. Amityville house Horror. Anything, that's so. what I was thinking. <laughs> no, no, we were there for a good long chunk of time, and my parents to this day never, you know, believed that it was haunted. Still, they don't believe day. it. Oh, mm -hmm. wow. Yeah. And so my my family lived there for a good probably 20 some odd years before um, before we all moved. Well, I guess my, that goes to my next question. Did you ever or did anybody ever, I guess you could say, research, research the house and see if anything awful happened? Maybe the family that lived there before when it was built. Do you know anything that you can we, share? Yeah. So a little bit. We were the first ones to live in that house. It was a brand new home. Oh, brand, brand new, new development. Yeah. So the only thing I can think of is the land. So I did do research on the indigenous people that lived there hundreds of years prior to us. And they did bury their dead on hills at the time. And I did live on one of two hills in my small town. So, you know, jury's still out, uh, but it could have been something poltergeist, like the movie Poltergeist, where we were actually uh, unknowingly on some ritual burial ground. You never know about the stuff like that. Yeah, I yeah. yeah I, I've got my own ghost story that everybody on my channel already knows. I'll share that with you too off, off channel because I mean they've heard it dozens of times already. So uh, yeah, it's pretty. It's pretty. It was. I, I can relate to you, and uh, you know, and I, I've had my skeptics like you. I'm sure you have, mm -hmm. but you know, and I always tell people unless it happens to you, you know, I know you yeah. won't believe it, but I always pray. I don't want it to happen to anybody else. At least not what happened to me. And so I'm sure you can relate the same thing. Yeah, 100%. <laughs> so uh, let me go back to your book again. Uh, I, actually, I want to share a little video. Uh, I'll display your uh, website here in a minute. Uh, but ladies and gentlemen, she has got a little short video on her website, which I'll share with you, uh, the website address. But it's a little video uh, to intrigue you uh, on this uh, new book of hers you know, called They Hide. So if uh, Bob Van Buren can do this right, <laughs> let's see. We will see if we can get this on and uh, share this with uh, the audience. So here it goes. Wow. Man, if that doesn't give you nightmares in itself, wow. <laughs> that was yeah. very well done. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, and I there is a creepy clown story in there as well. Creepy. Oh, yeah. Uh, creepy clowns. I mean, mm -hmm. that's... A lot of people are scared of clowns. Even before the movie It came out, there's people that just don't like clowns, whether it's Bozo or otherwise. <laughs> right. Well, and then, now it did say in your video April of 2023, but mm -hmm. the actual date was April 7th. So that book is, is available now, correct? That's right. Yep. People can get it now. Uh huh. 
That's right. And uh, where can they get it? If they say that we've already intrigued you know, a lot of people here, what are some best ways for them to uh, uh, come order it from you? Um, the best way is my website, uh, francescamaria.com. And I'll display uh, that right now, too. So, okay. okay. And same with that. the comics as well. Okay. And ladies and gentlemen, for those of you on the audio part, it is Francesca francescamaria.com. That's F R A N C E S C A. M A R I A dot com. Okay, go ahead, Francesco. And what else will they see on this website? They can order your book, obviously, but is there other information on your website as well? Yeah, I've got a lot of short stories that I've written that are there up there for free if people want to read more of some of the things that I do. I'm also in a couple of other anthologies by Crystal Lake Publishing. And so links to those are also on my website. Interviews I've done, articles I've written, videos I've done. So a lot of information, a lot of, a lot of content that hopefully people will find entertaining there. Oh, that, that sounds really, really, really intriguing. <laughs> so on your, uh, your scary stories, uh, the one you just wrote, um, actually you got most of it, a lot of it from your, your nightmares and some of your personal experience. Did you have to do any extra research? I mean, I guess what I'm asking, did you get any other sources from anybody like to, to incorporate or was it all from your imagination, your experiences? Yeah, so there's a couple of tales that were kind of historical fiction, so I wanted to do it right. And so I did do a lot of research. Like, for one, the, the first story, the witch story, is called Wisterfield Murders, mm -hmm. and it takes place in a Salem-esque New England-type mm -hmm. town. And so yeah. I wanted to do be respectful and, and look at the indigenous people at the time, what was the relationship between them and the colonists at the time, uh, what was life like then, same thing with the werewolf story. It takes place in the Loire Valley in France in the 16th century. So I wanted to understand what life was like there, growing oh. up in an orphanage. So each of the stories that have like more of a historical context, I went back and did research just to make sure I wasn't misrepresenting anything. And I was sure. being as accurate as I could be. Yeah, and make sure you don't know what, what call it anachronisms, you know. Yeah, so. yeah right. Well, that's great. Right. You really that that makes it more intriguing because you've done like if you do it from a historical context, uh, like that. So it kind of takes you, you know, those kind of stories take you back where you actually feel like you're there. Yeah, at that hopefully, time. hopefully, if I've done my job right, hopefully, <laughs> yeah. Now that your book, um, they hide. You said there's 13 stories in there, mm -hmm. but is each short story in there? a standalone or are they or does any of them relate or this kind of for lack of a better word a sequel or a spin-off of any other story or are they all standalone yeah they're all standalone they're all their own unique story um some of them are shorter than others some of them are long to the novella type stage the last story in the collection is called the gathering and it's gathering. A, a series of stories within a story so the oh. premise of it is all the ghouls and goblins, all the monsters gather on the longest night of the year in this wooded hollow to share their human horror stories for the year. And it's a contest. So who's got the scariest or worst human story uh, or human ex exposure story that they can tell in the year? And the, and the, best, uh, the best three win prizes at the end. For you personally, what is would, what I say... Uh... Um, hate to ask you, what's your worst nightmare as far as what would that be? Would it be, mm. I mean, a cryptid, a ghost, demonic possession, aliens? Do uh, you have a certain thing that really, really kind of makes your skin crawl? Zombies? or? <laughs> yeah, you know, all of them for sure. Really? Um, but if I had to pick one, you know, I grew up very, very strict Catholic. Mm -hmm. And so I'm not practicing any longer, but that that d demonic possession, um, the exorcist stuff kind of got into my psyche early on. So I'd say if, if anything really truly terrifies me, it's whether I believe in the devil or not, I don't jury still out. Um, but that sense of something else taking over you and you're losing control and you may be harming yourself or harming the, your loved ones around you. Oh, that to me is, is pretty terrifying. Like either demonic or even alien possession. One yeah. Two. yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and, you know, a lot of a lot of mental well, illnesses have that, too. And so, you know, that would be really terrifying as well. It almost, you know, like a split personality where you have two personalities fighting over the same body. Sure. You know, yeah. And so that same way. Now that you, okay, you shared yours. It's only fair I share mine. My Yay. 
biggest fear, biggest fear, and I'm not so much claustrophobic. I don't mind being in you know small enclosed spaces. Is if I feel like I'm trapped in there, there's mm-hmm. no escape. Like for example, an elevator that stops, you know, and especially yeah. if I'm by myself, you know, yeah. there's no one there. <sighs> so yeah, um, and I'll tell you how it started. Uh, I was five years old. I was visiting my grandparents and I had two cousins. They were about my age, four, five, and six. We were playing hide and seek in the house. So I was it per se. And I hid in my grandparents' closet. It's dark and there was no light in there either during the day. It was during the day, but it's really dark. I hid in the closet. Well, my cousins figured out I was in there. But instead of opening the door and say, hi, we found you, blah, blah, blah. I could feel it. I could hear them. They put their backs against the door. And so I'm pushing the doorknob. I can't get out. And now you know, I'm banging on the door, letting me out. They think I'm playing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm actually crying. I'm in, almost in a fetal position by the time my grandmother got them away. Yeah. And I think that's where it started. So, yeah. the, the, you know, I just, I can't stand to be, feel like I'm trapped somewhere. That's yeah. me. <laughs> and that's such an early age. I mean, that will definitely leave an impression on you. And, and honestly, hearing you describe it, that's how I felt in the bathroom too. Just that mm-hmm. sheer panic of like, get me out, get me out, get me out. Yeah. And that stayed with me. And I always told people, I said, now, if you're with me in an elevator and it stops, you probably don't want to be in the elevator with me anymore because I'm probably <laughs> going to be climbing the walls. <laughs> <laughs> now, Bob, you promised a, a ghost story. You haven't set, shared your ghost story yet. Well, I, I'll, I'll tell you after the show. My audience okay. has already heard this show oh, okay. over okay, and okay. over, so they, they, they're right. probably tired of hearing it by now. So <laughs> okay. yeah, after after our show is over, we go offline, right. and I'll, I'll share what, what happened. It was pretty... Uh, Thank you. I couldn't talk about it for, wow, 10, 12 years. It was a long uh-huh. time before I could open up, but it was it was horrific. I will tell you this much. It was my audience. Okay. It deals with the Ouija board. Oh, yeah. Say no more. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. I get you. Mm-hmm. So... Uh, your monsters here. I'm going to ask you on, on they hide. The artwork itself. I got. I'm just intrigued. Is this uh, without giving any details away of your stories? Obviously, does the artwork here fit into any of the stories, or is this more of a generic thing? Or I guess what I'm asking is, does is this artwork could this be one inside one of the stories? <laughs> Maybe. Maybe. You're not going to give me any information, are you? <laughs> nope. Nope. you got to read it to find out. <laughs> Those eyes under the stairs. That's what that's what really gets me. <laughs> yeah. yeah. He, he did a really great job with those. I'm really happy how it turned out. Uh, on your stories, uh, one thing I like about scary stories is, and not all of them uh, are like that, but I love ones with twist at the end where you think you've got it figured out and then... The, for lack of a better word, the author clobbers you, yeah. you know, yep. and you th- your whole world of what you thought was happening just shatters. And so I've always kind of like the, well, I'll say heart, the, the evil twist at the end, you know, like, yeah. oh no. Yeah. There's, uh, there's a, there's a couple of those in there. So my writing style, I'm more of a pantser than a plotter, which means oh, okay. I write by the seat of my pants. Um, and a lot of times I don't know the ending until it's written. And that keeps the story fresh and interesting for me and hopefully makes it unpredictable to the reader. Um, And so there's a lot of stories where the ending might not be what you think. See, I like stuff like that. So that brings me to the question in. Uh, So when you write your stories, now some authors do this, and there's nothing wrong uh, either way. But some authors, when they write a book, whether it's drama, comedy, or, or horror, they already know where... Character A is at the beginning, and they've already figured out where character B is going to, or character A is at the end. They just fill in the middle, you know. Right. But you said with you, you start with character A, and when you start it, you have no idea where it's going to go. You write as you go. That's intriguing. Yeah, <laughs> and sometimes I don't even have a character. It's a place or a setting or a word or a smell. Like I've got something, just very little to go on, um, and I just kind of close my eyes and say, okay, what do I see next? What, I, what do I hear? What do I smell? What do I sense? And so I just kind of close my eyes and let my imagination take me to different places, and then I just start writing. And the characters develop as I write. The setting develops as I write. I might know, like for this collection, I might know this is my witch story. 
but I have no idea who the witch is, how it comes about, what the ending mm -hmm. is. Um, and so it, it's, again, it's like me reading it for the first time as I'm writing it. It's, it's really an exciting way for me to do it, do the work. So when you, I'm gonna ask you this, when you've written a story, well, I'll, I'll give a character, say character A again. Mm -hmm. Have you ever had it where you write, you, you keep writing, you don't know how it's gonna end, but then maybe for lack of a better word, you kind of paint yourself in the corner do you ever have to back up and say, okay, let's rewrite this or take this character to a different way than where you were in the story? Have you ever had to do like a rewrite or do you pretty much say, this is how I'm going to write it, this is how I, I did it? And you, you know, you never had to rewrite your story. Yeah, so everything I've ever written has been rewritten. Uh, it so, has. okay. Every, like this book has gone through, um, I think, six different revisions before it went to publication to make sure it was oh, wow. just perfect. Um, and so, but the, the bulk and the bones and the meat of the stories stay from the first draft. So the beginning, the middle, and the end, the characters, who they are, what the motivation, what happens, those pretty much stay the same throughout. Um, in the editing, I just try to kind of clean it up and maybe make some things come out a little bit more mm -hmm. or, or hold the suspense a little bit more. Um, but for the most part, um, those are kind of, nuts and bolts stick with it. Have I ever sure. um, written myself into a corner? I think because it's sh they're short stories, mm -hmm. um, they're a little bit more forgiving than in a novel, right? So if you've got one character or let's say six of the same characters that you're writing for 100,000 words, I'm only writing one or two characters in you know 2,000 to 3,000 words. So I've got a lot more freedom. I don't have to, um, again, paint them into a corner is, isn't as much, of an, um, uh, as much of a problem in a short story as it is in a longer, longer fiction. And you've written, like I said, in this, this, this book you've written has 13 short stories and you're mm -hmm. writing a comic book uh, series now too. Have you ever written uh, like a large novel? Not yet. So, yeah, no, not yet. So uh, there's a couple of reasons for that. One, it intimidates me. Writing a novel <laughs> scares me. Um, I don't know that I've got, it's a lot <laughs> of work, but I don't, I also don't know that I love a subject or a topic or a character enough to spend a whole year plus writing it and developing it. So until I find that, um, thing that I'm really passionate about, I'm going to, you know, put the novel idea on a back burner there. Sure. And short stories, some might say would be a little bit easier because I mean, you don't, have to fill up, like I said earlier, a lot of the details. You've got to build up your story and, you know, fill up any kind of, you know, quote unquote, dead spaces in the novel. So you can, short stories are pretty much, you know, you, you get your, your characters here and you get right to the point. <laughs> well, so, some of my writing colleagues find short stories more difficult than novels because really? of the word economy, because you don't have the oh. same freedom to build the character. In a very short amount of time, you've got to do a whole story. You've got to introduce a character, introduce a scene, plot, setting, intrigue, feeling, emotion, in you know a quarter or less of the number of words that it would take in an actual novel. We got a comment from the audience. I want to share with you. Uh, it's more of a, and let's see what you think about this. Uh, Freaky Geek says, "I think the spookiest parts to any house are the basement, attic, and closet. Mm -hmm. The darkest places, I guess. Do you agree or?" With that, do you disagree? Hundred percent agree. Yeah, we didn't have a basement in our house, but we had a garage that you kind of stepped down into, and so the scariest parts of our house were definitely the closets, the attic, and hmm. our garage. Yeah, agreed. Did, did, oh, the garage too. Mm -hmm. Did you not have any windows in the garage, or what? Mm -hmm. Ooh, see that makes it even yeah. worse. <laughs> yeah. And you know what's trippy about closets? Like they were such that was such a traumatic experience for me that as an adult whenever I moved into a place, I would take the closet doors off. You won't find closet doors in any bedroom that I've ever lived in since. Wow, that's probably a smart move, you know, <laughs> considering yeah. your history. Yeah. Uh, wow, I, uh, you know what, I, I'd almost venture to say, I'm surprised you don't keep the bathroom door on either. <laughs> or take the well, lock off, take the lock yeah, off. Yeah, yeah, when I have guests, I close the bathroom. <laughs> oh yeah, of course. <laughs> Um, 
let's see. Uh, here it is. Uh, you, you know, you talked about you're doing your research earlier. You've asked some people mm -hmm. different things. Yeah. Got a comment uh, about cryptids, actually. Oh, great. Uh, Texas, text from Texas Front Porch. He's asking if she ever wants to interview people that have had cryptid encounters. I may know one or two. Fantastic. And Tex is a really good guy. I've known him 40 years. How nice. he's put up with how he's put up with me for 40 years. I still don't know the answer to that question. I mean, he should have punched me in the face a long time ago. So, <laughs> so, so I've got some cryptid stories if Tex wants to hear. So, um, there's yeah. an inter there's an interview that I did for another podcaster. It's called Sinister Scoop, and she's all about cryptids. She interviews authors and have them tell specific local legends. And so I talked a little bit about it there, but. I am in California, not too terribly far from the Sierra Nevadas, and on a vacation, uh, summer vacation one year, we went up to this place called Hyam Palm, okay. which is right at the, in the middle of the Sierras, and it's legendary Bigfoot area. Ooh, and is it? Okay. My older siblings would scare me, like, oh, what was that? Was that Bigfoot? You know, something, you know, <laughs> there was a creak in a tree or a you know, loud noise or something, but... I remember us being out on the deck in this vacation home and hearing this loud, terrifying screech, Ooh. unlike a bird, unlike an animal you've ever heard. And my dad said, okay, kids, let's go in now for the night. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, probably a good idea. <laughs> probably a good idea. Yeah, we don't know what it was, but it was definitely something that was intriguing and scary to hear. And what was the name of that YouTube channel or the interview that you talked about earlier? What was the name of it again? Sinister Scoop. Sinister, sinister scoop. scoop. Sinister like an scoop, ice cream. folks. All right. Wow. Sounds intriguing. I'm sure Tex will be checking that out for sure. So, wow. So you even you you actually have some cryptid stories yourself. Wow. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. I'm trying to think if there's any others. Um, more in the local legends from where I am, it's mostly ghost stories than it is cryptids. Ghost um, stories are intriguing too. I believe it. <laughs> yeah. There's, I live by Carmel Mission, so one of the missions in California, and there's supposedly like a headless horseman type ghost that wanders the mission area. Um, the mission itself is supposedly haunted. There's a lot of really, you know, difficult, horrendous things that happened um, to the indigenous people at the missions. And oh, so yeah. that kind of leaves an imprint. Um, and it, it's got a very oppressive kind of heavy energy. And so I wouldn't be surprised if there's some hauntings there. Restless spirits, of course. Yeah. yeah. Do you believe, now I've heard different stories. Now, ghosts, I mean, I've still, because of my story, I believe it. But do yeah. you also think that places, um, have, for lack of a better word, have, quote, memories? And what I mean by that, it's maybe something really horrific happens at, in this house, okay? But okay. there's not necessarily ghosts, but there's residual there. Yeah. You know what I'm talking about? Do, do, yep. Have you heard of that? Or do you believe that too? Yeah. A hundred percent. Yeah. So uh, a little unknown fact, I'm also a psychic medium and you a psychic are. detective. Okay. Yeah. Good. So I've gone through and I've done house clearings before. And so, yeah, what you're talking about is residual hauntings, which is not conscious hauntings where the ghost, you can interact with it, but residual meaning something left a stain, something really traumatic happened in a particular area, whether it's a violent death, a suicide, something and it, it stays in the walls it stays in the ground it stays in the in the in the house or, or in the in the building and what that is is like a broken record like a haunting that's kind of stuck on rewind um and there's no consciousness to it it's almost just like um like an imprint something that's that's just there um but it's not a, a stuck ghost or a stuck spirit Kind of like, like the old VCR tape, you just play it and rewind it, play it, yeah. and rewind it over and over and over again. Wow. Exactly. And and there's some places that hold that kind of memory imprint better than others, you know, homes that have, you know, running water nearby, or sometimes there's like um, quartz in the ground near the foundation of the home. So it just kind of depends, you know, if you've got the perfect environment for something like that to take place. Wow. And, and I've often heard people burn sage. Does that help? It does. Yeah, it does. It does. I've never yeah. done that, so I, I don't know much about it. <laughs> yeah, for residual hauntings, it does. But when you've got something a little bit more challenging, Palo Santo is better. Okay, so I, I, hadn't, I hadn't heard of that either. What about like holy water? Or is that really for exorcisms more than, than houses? It, it works okay. You can bless the home with it. Yeah, it works. it works fine. It doesn't hurt. 
it doesn't hurt. Okay. Wow. I bet I bet when you were in California, well, you are in California, but California, there's all kinds of stories out there, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. there's there's a lot. I mean, it's one of the, you know, younger states, but it's got a really long history. You know, I'm in a area where it was the first capital, Monterey, of California. And, oh, really? you know, people were visiting here in, you know, the 1700s and um, lots of different very harsh history in the development of California. Wow. Someone else has commented. Let's see, I'm going to get your comment on this, too. We're kind of getting into this now, but we're going to go back to your book, Great. of course. Uh, Tack One says, my son would talk to someone in the closet as a child, speak and respond. No door in his room to this day. Yep. I hear you. I hear you. You know, a lot of times people think that, you know, as kids, we all have imaginary friends, and I'm mm -hmm. sure that's true. I'm also sure that some of those were actual spirit beings that either maybe your son was a medium and could see spirit, maybe it was an imaginary friend. Um, my husband grew up in rural kind of Pennsylvania and mm -hmm. as a little kid he swore he had an imaginary friend that looked like an indigenous, you know, Native American in full, oh, wow. you know, deer skin and everything and he knew him very well and he was too little to make that kind of thing up in that level of detail. So to this day, he's convinced that it was a real spirit that he saw. Wow. Didn't harm him though, obviously. No. It's just a playmate, right? Yeah, that's right. No, it was a, it was a good spirit. That's great. So uh, on your book, which we'll go back to, uh, you, know, you got scary stories. So um, without giving details away, of course, I don't want, I want people to be intrigued and buy your book, but um, are all of the we'll call them entities no matter what it is a spiritual physical being whatever are they all quote unquote the bad guys in the story or the villains in the story are there any heroic beings in these stories yeah there's quite a few monsters that you might have empathy for and are the ones that save the day at the end um, and some aren't monsters. You know, they might look like monsters, but they're actually not monsters at all. Mm -hmm. Some are humans that turn into monsters. Um, so there's kind of a, a mixed bag of everything in there. Oh, really? About how, um, on your stories, on the average, uh, they're all short stories, obviously. How many pages on average are there? Oh, it's hard to do. Yeah. So in the, in the book itself, it's totals over 200 pages of story. Oh, that's um, perfect. Okay. But, but each story itself, like the first one's probably a good, maybe 20 pages or more. There's some that are only two pages long. So it really, it really varies as far as the length from story to story. Now, I think that's intriguing though. I like, I like what you've done here with that book, uh, because you know, sometimes I personally, you know, well, everybody, we all, sometimes we all get busy and we got to mm -hmm. run. Sometimes I'll pick up a novel. Maybe it's an interesting novel, mm -hmm. but, you know, I'll put it down and I'll get busy and then I'll go to work and all these other, and maybe it might be months later where I still see my bookmark in there, but I have forgotten what, wait, what did chapter one, mm -hmm. chapter two, I'll go ahead and have to reread it again. To, mm -hmm. And then by the time I read one and two again, then I put it down again. So... I yeah. like your anthology here. I think that's a great thing. Thank uh, you. Because I think, it, you know, and like I said, I want to I encourage my audience. I know I'm feeling my horns coming out here. But uh, <laughs> you got to buy Francesca's book. But I would encourage you, you know, here I am, my, and this is my evil side talking. Wait till it's at night, right before you, you're trying to go to sleep. Let that stay with you, what you just read, and make sure it's on a nice lightning and stormy night. Would that be a okay uh, suggestion, Francesca? <laughs> that sounds pretty perfect. Yeah, that sounds pretty darn perfect. <laughs> I don't know that they'll get sleep, but, you know, hey. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's what I do. Uh, I have in the past when I watch or rent, you know, a, a scary movie or watch a scary movie. I, I don't know. I just. I guess I'm a daredevil. I'll mm -hmm. wait till at night, and if it's raining, or especially if it's storming, that's even better. Yeah. You know. Yeah, <laughs> I'm with you. I'm with you. Yeah, the stormier, the better. The blacker outside, you know, the wind whipping the trees, hitting the windows. Yes, that's the perfect time to tell ghost stories. Because you know, ghost stories is kind of like a roller coaster ride. You know, it's the mm -hmm. thrill. 
mm-hmm. you know, of what not's gonna what's gonna happen. So, right. Exactly. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm glad you're sharing your story with us. And like again, I'm going to uh, uh, put your website out here again for everybody to see. Uh, for those that just tuned in, so let me bring that up real quick for those that missed it. And uh, just to reiterate, uh, we have the website on the uh, the screen now. This is where they can buy your book, correct? Or books? That's right. Yeah, that's right. Okay. And then uh, they can also buy uh, your comic book here, too. Correct. And then you said there's three out right now as we speak? That's right. Yep. I've got three issues out of the Black Cat Chronicles series right now. Mm-hmm. Will there be, are there going to be more of mm-hmm. uh, the three? So it's going to be a continuing story on these on these comics. Yeah, each of this, each of the series, each of the comics are standalone, so you don't have to read all three. You can just read one, and you know it's it's its own story. Oh, it's issue. a different era. It's not like a continuation. Mm-hmm. Okay, all right, yeah. that's perfect. Yeah, so you can just pick up one if you want, or if there's one particular location that intrigues you or topic, you can just pick up that one, and it's a complete story in and of itself. Now it's called the Black Cat Chronicles. <clears throat> uh, mm-hmm. Would it be safe to say, or can we assume that there is a black cat in each one of these stories, or is that yes. there is there is a black cat that figures into it? Oh, so the black okay. cat. So do you remember like the tales from the crypt, where the stories were narrated by the crypt keeper? Yes, uh, I do. I love that show. <laughs> That's the black cat. So the black cat is the narrator of the stories through each of the comics. Oh, you're saying it from the black cat's point of view. Ooh, that's even more intriguing. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds like the old Stephen King movie uh, show. It's called Cat's Eye. Oh, yeah. yeah. So yeah. I'm intrigued. And, and I like that. Can you show that again? You showed it just now. You, sure. You, you, you scanned it, and you have a lot of bunch of the artwork or the pictures that are in there of sure, one. So to. look at this, ladies and gentlemen. It's a comic book, but it's the Black Cat series. So, man, just those pictures alone should intrigue you. There's three uh, books of that. Look at that. Oh, wow. Whoever did that did a great job. It yeah, looks really Nate, good. Nate Olson is the artist. He did the coloring and the, the all all the work that went into the art part he did. Okay. And let me ask you something right uh, I've asked other authors this. Let me get your opinion too. Let's sure. just say there's somebody watching this right now and not mm-hmm. only are they interested in your book, but maybe they've written maybe a short story, maybe horror, but maybe something and they don't know what to do with it. Okay, mm-hmm. maybe they, it's just sitting on their desk collecting dust, and maybe they want to do something with it, but they don't know what to do with it or where to go. So, what would you suggest to it, like an up and coming author who hasn't published anything yet? Sure, yeah. So, I would find your local writers group. So, there's if you're a horror writer, there's Horror Writers Association, there's Science Fiction Writers Association, there's even just local, like, geographic writers group. Okay. So, find a local group become a member, and then ask their advice. Um, my whole journey started once I became a local member of my Horror Writers Association chapter. I found out what a submission calls were. I found out where to go to, which websites to go to to submit my work, um, what my work, the format that it should be. Oh, sure. You know, the different, you know, networking around who are the right publishers to, to pitch your stuff to, you know, what social media do horror writers connect with. Mm-hmm. And so... I learned all of that from my Horror Writers Association local chapter. That's perfect. Got some great uh, comments in the uh, audience again. Um, great. Sandra Piper said she just uh, subscribed oh, to you. Thank you. And the subscriber. So you Thanks, are Sandra. you are on YouTube, right? And f- that's right. Francesca Maria. Okay, so yeah. ladies and gentlemen, not only check out her website, check her out on YouTube, Francesca Maria. So thank Sandra, thank you. Appreciate that. Thank you very much. And regarding your little black cat, you know, on your comic strip, uh, Scott says, better looking than the Crypt Keeper, too. <laughs> I <laughs> Thank hope you. That, I, hope that, I hope a black cat's a lot more attractive than the Crypt Keeper. <laughs> yeah, right, right, right. Yeah. <laughs> oh, wow, that's perfect. Uh, yeah, someone even agrees. Yeah, very true, Scott. The cat is better looking. Yeah, I don't, I can't think of anything that's uglier than the Crypt Keeper. That's just yeah. me. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, Francesca, we really appreciate your time. Uh, let me go through again, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, she has just recently published a new book, uh, April 7th of this uh, year, 2023, called They Hide Short Stories to Tell in the Dark. There are 13 unlucky, oh, uh, scary stories <laughs> in there that you definitely want to check out. If you're a horror fan like me, this is the book for you. And if you like comic books, 
specifically scary comic books, check out on her website The Black Cat Chronicles. Here's the first one called Greyfire Cemetery. So, more of that looks very, very intriguing. So, uh, Francesca, we uh, thank you for being on the show and definitely uh, when you write some new material. Uh, if you've got anything else you want to talk to us about, we'd love to have you back on the show. It's been a pleasure. Awesome. Thank you so much. And thanks everyone for watching. It's been so much fun. Really appreciate it. And good luck to you too. Thank you. Thank you. You too. And ladies and gentlemen, that's all going to be for the Van Buren Variety Show tonight. I appreciate it again. I'd really appreciate it if you go to the Van Buren Variety Channel and hit that subscribe button. Make me feel good. And if you like tonight's guest, if you like tonight's topic, there's a like button down there too. So uh, our guests would appreciate that. And if you're not watching this show live, if you're watching this again days, weeks, months after the fact, you can leave a comment. And I'll make sure that Francesca sees it, and I'll forward it over to her. But make sure you also go to her website, francescamaria.com. You'll see her works, and I uh, think you'll be intrigued with what you see there. That's all for me tonight, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you enjoyed the show. Uh, this is Bob Van Buren. I will be back next Tuesday evening with another guest and another interesting topic. So good night, everybody. <laughs>